So at this point, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, speaker Dr. Margarita Alegria. Margarita Alegria is the director of the Center for Multicultural Mental Health Research at the Cambridge Health Alliance. She is a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and currently serves as a principal or co-principal investigator of two National Institutes of Health funded research studies. Dr. Adeglia's published work focuses on the improvement of healthcare services delivery for diverse racial and ethnic populations, conceptual and methodological issues with multicultural populations, and ways to bring the community's perspective into the design and implementation of health services. Dr. Alegria also conducts research that will contribute to an understanding of the factors influencing health disparities and testing infer interventions aimed at reducing disparities for ethnic and racial minority groups. And I'd like to add a fellow Puerto Rican. So at this point, I'd like Dr. Alegria to come up. Thank you. Before I get my presentation, I want to thank Marie. That was so inspirational. Uh, and I really want to thank the board that made this possible. Uh, and also, I wanted to uh, thank you for being here because, I mean, with the beautiful weather outside, and I heard that you don't get this weather that often, <laughs> to have you here uh, spending the time, I hope I don't disappoint you. Uh, I also wanted to make sure that I acknowledge that this is the work of uh, not only me, but a really talented group of people uh, in the Center for Multicultural Research. So we've been working uh, for over the last um, pretty much uh, 12 years. I've, I've been in Harvard 12 years, but even before that. And I guess the other thing I wanted to tell you is I was, uh, I was where you are. Can you hear me? Yeah, I was where you are uh, not that long ago. I never, ever in my life, let me go back to this, uh, never in my life thought I would get to be a Harvard professor, ever. Um, I actually was um, a research assistant at you know, University of Puerto Rico, then move on to do uh, graduate work, uh, went to uh, Georgetown, did work, but never in my life. And what I want to say is where you are, you know, you can have the world. Uh, this is our time, uh, so take advantage of it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I'm going to compress um, 12 years of work in a 40-minute presentation. <laughs> so I want to make sure that you probably are going to uh, think I'm um, a little uh, schizophrenic and going back and forth, going back and forth. But I'm trying to really put everything together to characterize, you know, the different stages and why I think um, this is so important, uh, especially for the Affordable Care Act. So my, okay, my my actual um, topic is reengineering behavioral health care as part of the Affordable Care Act to respond to minority communities especially Latino communities. And I'm basically going to cover three uh, rapid topics. The first is I'm going to talk some statistics about the changing demographics of Latinos in the U.S. I'm going to discuss some findings of policy and provider level challenges that are confronted by Latinos receiving mental health care. And then I'm going to talk about just two promising interventions that we've tested and tell you a little bit about where I think we should go and why I think with the next uh, round of the Affordable Care Act, how we should reconfigure and re-engineer our service delivery. The first thing that I should tell you, and people have started talking about it, is the healthcare system is going to be transformed by the Affordable Health Care Act. Basically, what happens is we're going to get 32 million new people coming in as part of the uh, exchanges and as part of the Medicaid expansions. These are, in their majority, ethnic racial minority populations, dramatically. So why should we care for Latinos in healthcare reform? First, Latinos, I mean, people were shocked when the uh, elections came in, and suddenly we, people started finding that Latinos are here, but we've been here all along. <laughs> it's just they didn't really tune in until after the election. But now everyone's like in gear that we're here. Uh, but we've been increasing in dramatic percentages, 58% from 1990 to 2000, 43% from 2000 to 2010, 
Uh, we're now more than 50 million people, but we're going to be 30% of the population. This is really a dramatic change. If you see it here, by uh, 2050, we're going to be, you know, more than twice the size. So what you're seeing now, it's nothing, nothing compared to what's coming. It's going to be a dramatic shift, and people are not prepared, like they were not for the elections. But now people are paying attention. It's going to have a different feeling. But for healthcare reform, look how much the change is. Latinas will make up roughly 28% of that 32 million. Around 9 million of the people coming in will be Latinos because they're going to be um, part of the people that were previously uninsured and are coming in. In California, Latinos will account for 55% of the uh, estimated healthcare reform beneficiaries. And they're only 36% in California. So the numbers are way up than the actual representation that they are in those communities. And the same is going to be for Texas, Arizona, Nevada, Florida. It's just going to be a massive new coming of Latinos into healthcare delivery. I also want to tell you that immigrant children are skyrocketing. If you think the adult population is there, the children are you know, in dramatic droves. One fourth of the nation's 75 million children are mainly Latinos. By 2050, both Latino and Asian children are projected to be one third of the 100 million US children. And these children will need special things. So I think it's really, that's another group we have to prepare. The elderly would also be a dramatic group. Latino elders, uh, I just recently participated in an Institute of Medicine study about the needs of the uh, geriatric force, the elders. And I can tell you Latino and Asian elders are going to be a huge, huge part of the picture. And they have very different needs, very different needs, because some of these elders have never had a lot of care. And they have their other issues with, for example, behavioral health care. So it's, it's very important. We uh, did a paper, uh, Danny Jimenez, who is one of my mentees, on elder Latinos. And two things struck me dramatically. One was, actually, the Latino elders were doing worse than the white elders, which is really surprising. We didn't expect that. So they're doing worse in terms of their mental health than the white elders. But the second thing that surprised us is that only one in 10 elders receives access and quality to mental health care of those that need it. Only one in 10. So we have a lot of elders that are becoming disabled because they really don't get the care early enough to actually uh, you know, support them. The other problem we're going to have is we have a lot of problems in that as the cost of healthcare go up, Medicaid programs start limiting their payment to providers because they have to deal with this problem. But as a result, what happens is that we have a very low geographic supply of providers, particularly for multilingual populations. And as a result, if you have a, a very uh, short, small pool of providers, this limits your access to get care, and then this limits also the quality you're going to get. Because if you have all of these providers that are trying to solve the problems of this huge population with very limited time and very limited resources, what you get is not really quality care. So this is a huge problem that we're confronted. The other thing is we're still having problems with 59% uh, of unauthorized immigrants are uninsured. And most of these people are getting treated in emergency uh, care. And that's a huge problem because those people are really not follow up and we don't really uh, try to deal with the problems of integrating them into care at a preventive time so their problems don't become so severe that then it's really a hard thing to, to solve when you know, the person is so severe. So I think this is a, a big issue. So I want to tell you very quickly, given this scenario, what can research tell us? First, I should start by telling you there are two things that have struck everyone 
in looking at you know Latinos and immigrant health. The first is what's called the immigrant paradox. And the immigrant paradox was something very surprising because it's when, when people started looking at Latino immigrants coming from outside to the United States, they're always uh, found to be healthier, healthier, even though they are supposedly at a disadvantaged uh, situation. They've gone through incredible uh, experiences to come, but they still are found to be healthier. So that, that's what people call the immigrant paradox. The second thing that really is striking is that when people have studied as immigrants, their health deteriorates over time once they come to the US. And that's what's called the acculturation hypothesis. And people are like, what's going on? How could these people that come healthier get so sick after being in the US, which you would expect would be the opposite, right? So that's the acculturation hypothesis. So let me tell you, we started really being interested in trying to understand these two phenomena. And the first thing we study, and I should tell you, is we studied and found out that first, the immigrant paradox is not the same for all Latino groups. People group Latinos into a uniform category, but we're actually finding that it's not the same for everyone. So what we found is Mexicans, the immigrant paradox, you really see it for depressive disorders, for anxiety disorders, and for substance use disorders, with immigrants showing better rates, better rates than the US uh, born. Okay, the, for the Cubans and other Latinos, what we found is we only found the immigrant paradox for substance abuse, but we did not find it either for anxiety or for depression, which was sort of surprising. And the worst story, which being a Puerto Rican, I had to tell, is we found no paradox for Puerto Ricans. We're actually pretty much exactly the same as the US born. So let me show you some data, because I think, uh, well, I actually am going to skip the data because I have so much. But I'm happy to show you the data and show you the article where it shows that actually we only find the immigrant paradox mostly for Mexicans, but we don't find it as much for the other groups. But then what we did is I was so struck by why do we find different things for different groups? And what we studied is we, in this samples, in this study, which was the National Latino and Asian American study, we actually had a lot of data about family factors, about social factors, about contextual factors. So we looked to try to see, okay, what really explains these differences across the groups? And let me tell you the findings. This is a long uh, study, but what we found is that family harmony integration and employment, and self-perception of a high social standing really was what differentiated these groups, okay? So if you had those three things, you were actually more likely to not have a, to have a decreased risk of depression and a decreased risk of anxiety. For substance abuse, what we found is if you came to the US after you were 21 years of age, your chances of having a substance use disorder were almost nil, which is sort of sad. So the people, the earlier you come, the higher risk you have for substance use disorder. But if you come later, more as an adult, your chances are a lot less. However, this mostly holds, I should say, for girls than for boys, okay? So it's an important issue. The other thing that made a difference was religious attendance and neighborhood safety. If you lived in a neighborhood where there was a, it was a lot of safety, you were less likely to have a substance use disorder, okay? So what I wanna tell you about this it's not nativity per se. It's not being foreign born or not being foreign born that really explains the immigrant paradox for Latinos. It's actually uh, the, the things that you have, the family, the contextual factors, and the social factors. And social position is really important here, how people perceive themselves in their social context, how they see themselves relative to other people in their community really matters. 
This is one message I want you to see. Um, this is the acculturation hypothesis. And let me tell you, when you have less than one, so one is, uh, what you see here, one is being U.S. born. So these are U.S. born Latinos. And what we wanted to try to see is, if you're an immigrant arriving after seven years old or, or older, in your home country, what is the risk that you have of major depressive disorder? And as you can see here, it's less than one. That means you have 35% chance of being, uh, having a major depressive disorder. If you're five years or less in the U.S., it go, it, this is in your home country, it's 0.51. But once you've been in the U.S. for five years or longer, for more than five years, you're actually, your risk for major depression, it's actually the same as the U.S. born. So you actually, that protective effect gets over after five years. Pretty risky. Same for anxiety. You see it here. In the home country, it's a lot less. But it goes down. And that's actually not different than the one after you are in the US after five years. For substance abuse, however, people maintain their risk. Once you come here, even if you come here, the rates are smaller for people that come from, uh, from Mexico, uh, it, at least it shows that it, it is smaller for people that come from Mexico. So the other thing we wanted to try to understand is what could explain why people are getting, you know, sicker as they spend more time in the U.S. And what we did is we wanted to try to see what are the potentially harmful effects of leaving in the U.S. that actually seem to show that people get sicker over time. And we studied six potential pathways that the literature had said could be explaining these differences. One was perceived discrimination, because people have said that discrimination could be a harmful effect that you know, creates you feeling different and feeling rejected. The other is family cultural conflict, because there's been a lot of literature saying family cultural conflict uh, starts uh, augmenting itself the more time you spend in the U.S. We also looked at ethnic identity. We looked at dissatisfaction with economic opportunities. We looked at perceived social status and about neighborhood safety. And what we found is actually that the two best pathways that would explain this difference in changes risk was discrimination. So the more time you spend in the U.S. and experience discrimination, this seemed to affect you quite dramatically. And the second one was family conflict. The greater family conflict, the greater risk. So what we say in this paper is that the emotional consequences and severe family ties actually might outweigh social mobility. So people are being socially mobile, but they're losing some of what it's in themselves. If they can maintain their social ties, uh, and they can't really um, have a, a supportive home environment. The other thing we think is that people start experiencing a lot of acculturative stress because their children and themselves starting becoming distanced and having a very different, you know, being socialized into U.S. customs while they're coming in with very different values and beliefs and having a lot of tension because of that. One of the things we were shocked in this study was finding out that discrimination, uh, much to our uh, surprise, we thought discrimination would be perceived more by the Latino immigrants coming in. But what we found was the opposite. The people that perceive more discrimination are the US-born Latinos. So the more educated you are, the more um, wealth you have, the more you perceive discrimination as a Latino. But the interesting thing is the more time you spend in the US, the more likely you are to report discrimination. So people come in with very low levels of discrimination. And it seems like the more time they're here, they start seeing their relationships and how other people treat them in a very different light. So I think this is a very important issue of how we can avoid uh, behavioral health problems. So what's the, what is the message for healthcare reform? 
So for me, the message is that if we, we want to maintain wellness and avoid illness for Latinos, social conditions must include family harmony, integration in employment, self-perception of high social standing, safe neighborhoods, and institutional supports in the same way as a climate of receptivity. So what I mean is healthcare is not going to be enough. We need all of these social conditions and trying to think how are we going to offer people that come in social conditions that help them maintain harmonious family relations. How can we help them think of themselves in the condition they are with high social standing? You know, so these are the things we need to think. How can we make them feel that they belong here? That they belong? Because I think that that's the issue. Not having a feeling of belonging and that people are rejecting you in a different way. So health is not enough. Social programs that go hand in hand with this will be super important. So let me tell you a little bit about what we found about health services research. And you don't have to read it here. I'll tell you what it's about it. So we actually, in this sample, had a lot of people that looked like the people that are going to get in, into health reform. So what we did is with a statistician that actually became the, now is the dean of Harvard University, but he was uh, the chair of the statistical department. With the data that we had, we simulated Okay, what would happen if we get these people into healthcare reform and give them insurance? Okay, that's what we simulated with this data. And the finding is, what we found is that actually the difference between Latinos and whites would disappear. We actually would not see a disparities. We actually did see a disparity continue for African Americans. So I can tell you that insurance is not going to do the disparities for uh, African Americans. But it will for Latinos. You will reduce the disparities. Uh, we saw that if you had neighborhood clinics and universal insurance for this population, you could actually make the groups look very similar to what the, the rates of the whites uh, are looking for. But the surprising thing, and I'm sorry, let me go back to this. And this might be one of the things we found, and Smetley has said that in the Institute report, is 700 uh, Latinos use community health clinics 700% more than whites. 700% more than whites. And African Americans use community health clinics 550% more than whites. So if we give them access to a community health clinic and universal insurance, we will see a, a reduction in disparities. But the sad thing is even with that, even with that, between 59% and 66% of people with need, need for either mental health or substance abuse services will not go to care. So what we mean by this is that insurance in itself will not reduce the problem. We need to go outside the clinics. So what we found is we really think that health, health care reform will help include more people in, but it would not necessarily help us eradicate the problem of people accessing behavioral health care at least. And let me tell you why I think this is. We did in 2008 a study showing that if you look at what people receive in terms of access and quality just for depression care. And we selected uh, depression because depression is something that everyone, it's uh, easy to treat, there are guidelines to doing, it's not very labor intensive, and it can be identified very quickly. And what we found is that even, uh, even with something as you know, typical as depression, only 18.1% of Latinos receive access and quality care. Only 18.1. It's not that great for whites either. It's only 32%. So a lot of people are not getting what we call minimal, minimal guidance concordant care. So what are we finding? So we've done focus groups, and what we find is people tell us treatments are way too long, way, way too long. 
and they require a level of health literacy that is so high that it really doesn't, uh, they don't understand it. There's also problems with lingu uh, uh, language proficiency, language English proficiency. The other thing is they have a lot of issues with a provider that, you know, people think interpreters are the answer. But I want to show you something very, very interesting. We did a study uh, that's actually going to come out very soon, looking at communication. And what I can tell you is the communication of a person that is Latino, being born Latino, with a Latino patient, it's different than the communication of an, um, uh, a person that's white that knows Spanish and talks to that person. And the communication changes not only for the provider, but it changes also for the patient. The amazing thing is the diet, the communication, and how they spend the time changes if the person is a Latino that is raised as a Latino, and the other one is a Latino that it's a white that learns Spanish. So interpreter services, I, I tell you, this, this study found that it's not necessarily the answer. I want to caution you because people think, you know, well, we put interpreters and it solves the problem. And what we're finding is at least for behavioral health care, it might not. This is really important. So why, why do we think people are not getting that great care? So let me tell you, we actually study, we videotape providers and patients on their first visit when you're coming in for a first visit to a provider and actually had uh, providers that were willing to be taped and patients that were willing, obviously, with their consent. And we actually did 129 patients throughout eight clinics in the United States that saw mainly ethnic racial minority patients. The first thing I should tell you is 60% of their patients were white providers. And I don't have anything, by the way. I think providers are dying. They're doing an incredible job. But I just think it's important to try to see how we can make this work better. And uh, actually, the rates of retention were actually quite good. But what we found is that providers, first of all, providers, all providers, have to establish so much time engaging the person that they actually don't do such a great job in diagnosing the patient. So what we know is that providers don't actually have enough time to do a good diagnosis. And the second thing we found out is when providers use like symptom checklist with people are starting to use, patients don't come back. Patients actually don't come back. And it's surprising because the literature has said for years and years, providers should use symptom checklists to try to make sure that there's no disparity and they do a good assessment. And we were wondering, how come providers are not using this? And what we found is the people that did use it, their patients didn't come back. So providers figured this out very quickly and now are stopping to use it like that. But I can tell you, the other thing we found is there's a lot of bias. And when that patient comes in, the question that a provider asks a white person, an African-American patient, and a Latino patient, believe it or not, are not the same. So providers make a very quick impression and ask different questions by the race and ethnicity of the patient. Even when we adjust for everything else, they ask different questions. So it's really surprising how so immediately people have an image, okay, and then ask different questions. So that makes it uh, different. The other thing we found is that stereotypes happen in the first minutes of the interview very quickly. Providers actually have a stereotype of the patient, and patients have a stereotype of providers. People talk about all the stereotypes that providers have of patients, but what we found is patients have heavy, heavy stereotypes of providers. They see you, and if you remind them of someone, believe me, it's very quick that they like you or don't. And some people, because this study basically, once we videotaped that interview, when people came out of the interview, we separately interview the patient and separately interview the provider. And it's amazing how fast Providers tell you 
this patient's not for me, and I'm just going to refer them. And how fast patients tell, tell you, this provider, it's not really for me either. So people make those connections very quickly. Only 60% of people come to their second appointment. We lose 40% of people, 40% of people uh, after the first visit. Okay, so that's part of the problem. This is a case where we had a provider see a person that was big with a tattoo, this very heavy set man, and says, initially, and by the way, this is not the person, I'm just using some, I would never put uh, either patient or provider uh, uh, slides here, but the, the provider said how immediately she thought this person, is, I, I'm, you know, we're not going to work well together. So I'm going to refer this patient. And the provider basically starts doing, you know, a symptom checklist, very distance from the person, doesn't look, doesn't connect in the eye that much. And let me tell you, connection in the eye is one of the best predictors of who's coming back and who's not. Okay, so all those people putting information in their computers, think about it twice. So basically the person says, you know, um, She's very retracted from the patient, and the patient tells us, when I saw that woman, I knew she was not for me. I never work well with women providers, especially older women providers. And what happened was that this man, through the interview, in the middle of what she's doing her actuarial uh, symptom checklist, starts crying, sobbing in a moment, and starts talking about his trauma. And the woman drops her uh, thing that she had, moves close to the guy and starts asking him, you know, and gets close and touches him and starts asking him about his tattoos and he starts telling him about his life and the whole, whole experience changes 360 percent, 300 by just that change. And the man says, this woman was amazing. She really was able to connect and understand who I was. And the, uh, the woman, the practitioner, starts saying how she then understood this man really, I can work very well with this man. He's worth my time. So it's really important how we bring those things without, without our knowledge. The problem is we don't know. And the biggest problem we have in, this, in, in the area of disparities is Everyone, everyone thinks they don't make disparities. You ask every one of us and we would tell you, not me. The problem is when you videotape us, when you videotape us, you see us in action. The same provider doing an incredible job with one person and a horrendous job with the other. And that's all internal and that's the problem. The other thing is that we need to have this capacity for self-reflection when we are navigating with patients and how we become more of anthropologists with our patients rather than statisticians. We need to start thinking who this person is, what do they care about, why are they here, what, what are the things that drive them to care about them and changing their behavior. And that's actually the most important thing. The other thing you should ask yourself is what surprises you? Because people typically tell you that, you know, well, this surprised me. The person was really smart. And that means that you had a prejudice or a stereotype that this person would not be smart. And actually, patients say that providers typically think of themselves as less educated Patients think of providers as wealthier, so, and that's wrong. That's the two stereotypes that happen the most. The other thing that I wanted to tell you about is that when we ask patients, what are the things you want of a provider? If you had the ideal provider, what did this provider have? People tell you, well, I want a provider that listens. I want a provider that, that really, really listens. I want a provider that understands me. And I want someone that really spends the time. Let me tell you, the worst thing you can do for a patient is start looking at your watch or looking, checking in how much more time you have. Patients said that the more hurried you look, 
the less they like you. So really have that in your mind. No, honestly, because we're all harried people. And sometimes we do look at our watch, and we are not thinking about it, but the patient is. They're really checking on that. And the other thing is managing differences. The problem we found is when we did this, this, uh, uh, this is based on the interviews, we find that everyone pretty much universally mentioned those four themes, the same four themes. The only thing is when we asked them to describe what were these four things, people from different ethnic racial groups described them differently. So the preferences for what they mean for listening or managing uh, differences or actually spending time are not the same. So you need to check that with your patients. And let me show you something just very quickly. And I want you to try to identify which group with which. So tell me which of the three groups is the Latino group, which of the groups is the white group, and which of the groups is the African American group, if you can. Any, any volunteers? You can be courageous. OK. So the first one, the first one are African Americans. They wanted, they, they really want you to know that they're the expert on themselves. And it, it's true. It's something that came up over and over. Um, they talk a lot about people talking to them as if they are lower. And, and they mention this lobbying, feeling like you're talking down to them over and over repeated in the themes. We didn't find that for the other groups. Interesting, the, third, the second group is Latinos. And they want attention and a really, really close attention. And that you're paying attention is what they mean by listening. And the quality of the relationship is quite important. And they talk about not really, I'm not coming here for people to tell me what you think, what you think, what you think. They actually tell you they want someone that lets them express themselves, but they want an authority figure to tell them what do they need to do, you know. The, the last one is uh, white patients. They want someone that makes them feel comfortable to express their feelings, but they still want a distance. They don't talk about that close interpersonal distance as much as Latinos do. So it's just like different. What I want to show you by this, and I don't mean to stereotype, because this would also be stereotyping. Because everyone, what you need to do is think about what people want and how to really get that from the patient rather than anything else. So basically what I mean is that we're finding that the practice models that we currently have are pretty unresponsive to where people are. They really don't understand a lot of the experience of how difficult it is to acculturate to the US environment. They really have time limitations. People tell you that they have, if you need to see them, their time is gold. It's not so much paying money, it's time that they don't have to give you. So that's an important component. The other problem we found in making, uh, being able, is to really have them prioritize their health. They're so overwhelmed by things about their children, their families, staying connected to the uh, other country, that they, it's very, very hard for them to prioritize themselves. And we see this not only for Latinos, we see them across the board in ethnic minority populations. They have more pressing needs. And the other thing we're finding is they have multiple jobs. They can't have this idea that I'm gonna give you in two weeks an appointment at two in the afternoon and you're gonna come. That's not in their book because they don't even know what's gonna happen in two weeks. If they have a job and they have to work that day, they can come. So if you're planning on a typical routine of scheduling, it's not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. These people have two and three jobs and they find that morning, they call them and let them know if they're gonna have to work or not. In fact, that's why we know that actually 
healthcare uh, research and quality has shown that we keep on, even with all this 20 years of disparities, what we're finding is disparities are still stronger than they were before. We're not getting better in care. The sad thing is we're getting worse in care, and the quality indicators are showing that we're making no actual dent on disparities. So what does it tell us about healthcare reform? I think it tells us that the clinical aspects of healthcare reform are important, but so are the interpersonal aspects. We need to have better interpersonal contact with our, with our uh, patient. It's just not going to work. You can make them the best you know, surgeons or the best whatever, but if they don't have that good interpersonal communication, you're going to lose your uh, you're going to lose your patients. The other uh, thing is we need to think about how to help providers actually be able to digress this problems of bias, stereotyping, intuition. A lot of providers said they use their intuition because they have so little time to actually get in enough information about the patient. So what we're doing now, and I'll tell you hopefully. Five years from now, I hope to get invited again and tell you, we actually just got a grant from the Patient Center Outcome Research Initiative to actually work with patients and providers to see if we can uh, reduce that gap in the interpersonal relation. So I think it's really in, in that interpersonal uh, communication that we can make a dent. I wanted to talk to you about two actual interventions that we are doing that we hope can help. And that's the way we're doing in terms of trying to come up with ideas. The first one's called DECIDE. And it's, uh, it's actually, DECIDE is a patient activation and self-management intervention. And because one of the problems we're finding is ethnic racial minorities are typically disengaged. They come to care and they're hoping to see what do they tell them to do. And actually, what we're finding is quality. It's really so important, but you have to have the patient be activated to ask what they want and how the agenda of healthcare should be their agenda in collaboration with the provider, but it shouldn't be the provider's agenda only. So that's what we want. So we want to try to get optimal patient-provider communication. So what we did is this intervention. It's provided by a care manager. All our care managers were typically people that had associate degrees or a bachelor's degree. We trained them and we supervised them. And they actually, actually uh, talked to the patients and trained them for three sessions of one, how to ask questions of their provider, how to negotiate the agenda, and how to prioritize what they want out of care to be able to go very organized to the meeting with their provider so that they can get out of the meeting what they want rather than only what the provider. And let me tell you, this is not something particular to them. You know, I don't know about you, but I go to healthcare and you only have 15 minutes, or if you're lucky, maybe 10 and maybe five. Uh, you go in and you leave with more questions than you had. And then you go home and you're like, oh my God, I have all these questions and I don't really have a clue what to do. And that's exactly what happens. And so what we did is we compare in a trial of 700 people, uh, 13 clinics across the, the United States uh, that had North Carolina, Minnesota, New Jersey, New York, uh, Massachusetts, you know, all of these clinics. What we checked is to see, could we train patients on activation and self-management? And would this increase retention in care? What we found is yes, we can get patients to be more activated and self-manage their, their health. It really works in only three sessions. You can actually, and this is three sessions of 45 minutes. We can get patients to be more activated, and get them to be better managers of their health. And what I mean by self-management is helping them see that they need to know about their health because they're the only ones that are going to follow their health overall. And that's a really important aspect. The only problem we had is that um, 
even though we were able to do this, the rates of retention and the rates of actual uh, engagement in care didn't change. And what we found, we went back to the care managers to try to find out what happened. How come we couldn't get people to stay longer in care? Because we had done a previous pilot study, a big pilot study of 300 people, and had found out that we could increase uh, retention and engagement in care. But what we found is that providers were not that happy with activated patients. <laughs> providers were actually quite annoyed about this person coming with all of these questions. I mean, I only have, you know, such amount of time, and now this person that has never asked me what diagnosis they have, they not only want their diagnosis, they want to know why I didn't put them in this trial. They also want to know how come they're having this medication at this dose when, according to what they're reading, that's actually not the dose for them. And how come I haven't moved them to this tip typical uh, intervention that's available? And providers were telling us, you know, we're not, you know, we don't know all that information. Why, you know, suddenly you're bringing all of that information and it, this patient, it's, it's really a hard thing to do to actually start answering all these questions. So that's why we're having not only that, but we're trying to actually then, um, I'm sorry, let me go, actually trying, uh, whoops, um, basically, as a result of that, we're trying to then do a training for the providers. Because what we're finding is we're going to get so far only training the patients. But if we don't train the providers to be receptive to patient activation and self-management, they're going to find a block. And people said, you know, I don't want to do this. My provider, is, you know, is getting angry at me. They're getting really upset with me, and that's an issue. So I think one, two things, what does this tell us for healthcare reform? One, I think uh, activation and self-management interventions are a big, big component of getting people to get better quality care. It's not only the clinical aspect, we need to, for having patients to tell their providers what they really want of their care. And sometimes it's not more, they, they might want something different. And that's the, the problem we're having. The other thing is we need to use, uh, seeing how we can do this interventions in very low resource setting. We don't have more money to spend, so we have to do interventions that are low resource. And this is an intervention that's very quick and can change how providers, uh, patients think about their health in a quite dramatic way. Oh, wow, I'm moving this very quickly. Let me. See. The last thing I wanted to show you is an intervention that we did that's called, it's a comparative effectiveness intervention. And this is to move intervention outside the clinic walls. And I think because of what I told you, remember that I told you that people don't know where they be and if they can see, go to the clinic that day? What we decided to try is could we do the intervention, and this is actually, I give the credit to Kaiser Permanente developed the intervention. Yvette Lutman at the Washington site had done this intervention. But we wanted to do it with Latinos, low income Latinos with very low levels of literacy that we could treat in all of our community health centers. And what we did is we actually developed this and uh, work with Yvette Lutman in adapting this intervention for a year and a half. We changed the language. We change the literacy levels of what we're required to do. We change how we gave some of the uh, interventions, and we shortened the intervention. The intervention was a longer intervention, and we made it a six to eight sessions only. And the other thing we tested in this study is, can we give it by phone in the same way that we could give it in person? And if we give it by phone, will we get the same effect? And what we did is it's, uh, you know, we randomized and we did a three-arm trial. So we have usual care, which was someone in primary care, whatever their primary care provider did for them. We did tell the primary care provider this person has scored high on a depression scale. They should get something. That's what we told the uh, primary care provider. That's usual care. The second one is we random, everyone's randomized. The second arm is people would have a clinician 
contact them by phone, they would never ever see the clinician, ever, okay? And invite them to be participating. And the other group was invited to go to the clinic. The only thing we changed in the clinics, and I should tell you this because I think this was very important, the clinics, we work with the clinics to open clinics later at night so they could go earlier or later. And we also had Saturday clinics and in some places Sunday clinics. Okay? And so we randomized people to those three conditions. And um, really, we didn't know if this would work. And actually, the clinicians, when we were training them, were quite upset about having people that they would never see. They felt that they could not establish rapport if they never saw the patient. But we told them, this is the way it's going to be. So just to let you know, providers saw people both by phone or in the clinics. So everyone, it was not that a group of providers saw people in the clinics and another group saw providers in the phone. Everyone had to do a both so we could randomize. But um, it's basically, this is a very, again, short intervention. The only thing it does have that is quite important, it has a care manager too. Because what we're finding is these people have so many other problems that you cannot say, I'm just going to treat your depression and, oh, no, you're going to be, you know, your house is going to be foreclosed and you're going to be homeless. I'm not going to pay attention to that. I can't talk to you about that. Or my child is, you know, having just dropped out. You can't say, no, I'm not going to talk to you about that. So what we did put is we put care manager to help that person navigate other services that they might need. But in addition, gave them this trial. And what we found is very, very strong results. Very, very strong results. And telephone function the same as in person. Really function exactly the same. The interesting finding is patients, when we asked them after the trial about their therapeutic alliance, they were exactly the same in therapeutic alliance as the face-to-face. -face. So what we're finding is it more, it's more an issue for the provider, but apparently it is not for the patient. Not for the patient. So I think, you know, um, in conclusion, what I wanted to tell you is we need to be ahead of the curve. The numbers are humongous. We're going to have an exponential increase of Latino populations with limited options for care that are receiving right now low quality care. And we need to change those very traditional models of care that we have been using to include more the social component. We need to transform policy so that we can offer treatments by phone, by different media that don't take people to come to clinics. It's really, that's so passe, come on. I mean, and the second thing is, you know, if Walmart is opening all of this, you know, treatment centers, we need to be where people can be. We can't be asking them to come to us. We need to come to them. And then I want to say that sometimes, I mean, we don't think, but we have a lot of models we could extrapolate from the uh, low-income and middle-income countries that have proven extremely effective, extremely effective, have better the, the health of the uh, population more than the U.S. health, to actually use them in this country to actually get our populations to have more social justice and more equity. So thank you.